And now I'm happy to introduce our special rapporteur on freedom of religion that in the last few years has put a lot of new ideas into our heads and uh, in a very constructive way. So I'm happy that Professor Einer Bielefeld is with us and uh, he will give some of his comments and observations before we open up uh, for discussion. Professor Bielefeld. Thank you very much. Uh, don't expect any new ideas. <laughs> I'm merely stating the obvious. And uh, I will be brief in the interest of saving more time for what I like, interaction. So uh, His Excellency the Archbishop Tomasi started this podium with the question, can freedom of religion or belief and freedom of expression coexist? Of course, he knows the answer. And the answer is, no surprise now, yes. <laughs> they can exist. Moreover, they do coexist. And they must coexist. I mean, they cannot exist without the other. This was actually what the ambassador of the OIC said when quoting the Vienna formula that all human rights are universal, indivisible, interrelated, interdependent. I mean, take it seriously, interdependent. It means you cannot have the, other, the, the one without the other, and, the other and, and vice versa. So, I mean, not only can they coexist, they must coexist. And um, so, without freedom of expression, no human rights can exist. What would human rights be without people having the freedom to speak their mind, to also express their grievances? I mean, nothing would remain. It would be an empty shell. So, no human rights without freedom of expression. I would say the same is true for freedom of religion. No human rights, the entire system of human rights protection depends on respect for human dignity. How can you respect human dignity without respecting that existential dimension, which is, of course, it comes out in very, very, very different forms, and we have not endorsed everything, but the general dimension that human beings hold profound existential identity-shaping convictions and also have to organize their lives, shape their lives in accordance with these convictions. How can you? The answer, not at all. So, removing Article 19 of the UDHR, of the, uh, uh, of the ICCPR, means the whole system collapses. Removing Article 18, again, means the entire system collapses. We would not only be left with a gap, the whole system would cease to make any sense. So these human rights can coexist, do coexist, must coexist. They cannot exist without the other which is obvious. I mean, we all said it, didn't we? Uh, of course, we all know also human life is not easy. I mean, coexistence does not necessarily mean a totally harmonious coexistence. And that's why, I mean, it's a legitimate issue to go into details and to go into the issue of limitations, the restrictions. And here Javier said it, uh, that of course, I mean, these rights have certain limitations. I don't want to go into the technicalities. Um, I just want to say, let's always be very careful when talking about uh, limitations. Careful in the sense of being very precise. Because here precision counts. I mean, precision is not an academic virtue. Sometimes it's really, I mean, the substance of rights depends on being very, very precise. And again, I mean, that would require then going into technicality, which we are not going to do. But uh, uh, when it comes to drawing limitations, always work on the assumption freedom is the starting point. Freedom is a right. Freedom is a right inherent in human beings in respect for their dignity, for their human dignity. 
and limitations require the extra argumentation. So the, the onus of argumentation, the burden of argumentation falls on those who deem certain restrictions necessarily, and that's, let's always restrict the restrictions, not restrict the freedom. So restrict the restrictions to what is really necessary. Uh, and uh, proportionality means more than a sort of vague balancing exercise. Really, the I mean, the, the least interference that is really necessary in order to do justice to human beings, to their human dignity. And you cannot respect human dignity without respecting freedom in all these areas, freedom of expression, freedom of religion or belief. So it's freedom of human beings, which brings me to Human Rights Council Resolution 1618. And the ambassador of the OSC quoted their very long title. I don't know the title by heart. <laughs> it's really very long. Uh, but I would like to focus on one important word, and that is human persons. So here. And there I see a turning point from the previous resolutions and a very important point of, uh, of, of uh, clarification from the previous resolutions on combating defamation of religions, which could give the impression that religions in themselves would receive a legal protection of their reputation. No, it's human beings having that legal protection against stereotypes, negative stereotyping against discrimination, against hostility, against extreme forms of hate speech, incitement, and this somehow comes up in the title. And uh, why is this focus on human beings? Does it mean to subscribe to an anthropocentric worldview? You know it from, I mean, the ancient times, Protagoras, the human being is, in the, is the measure of all things. No, no. It's not, it's not an anthropocentric worldview. To say <laughs> human beings are the right holders really stems from taking religions seriously. The more you take it seriously, I'm a religious person myself, the more you take it seriously, the more you have to be aware of profound differences Differences we will not be able to reconcile at the level of contents. I mean, that always leads to very superficial forms of merging. No, I mean, there are profound differences. There are irreconcilable differences. So looking for the common denominator, a denominator which can also be protected legally, is the human being. That's the common denominator. Human beings professing religions or beliefs, sometimes not doing so not wishing to do so, but human beings practicing, human beings organizing their lives as individuals, don't forget the community that I mentioned, communities count for both rights, by the way, also for freedom of expression. Yeah? Um, so uh, human beings, I mean, they are the, I would say the only common denominator that can receive protection by legal norms in a consistent manner, because if you want to give protection to religion per se, you have always to single out certain religions, which is the problem with blasphemy laws. And that's why I think it's really an, uh, an important turning point that uh, a Human Rights Council resolution focuses clearly consistency on human beings. But human beings, we shouldn't have that, very complex beings, very complex beings with existential dimensions. And I mean, so it's not an easy anthropocentric worldview. It's not a worldview at all. Human rights are not a worldview. Yeah, so re they respond to experiences of injustice and trying to cre create justice, improve the conditions. But I mean, then the right holder is the human being, also in the sphere of, the, of, the, of these existential questions. Because it's the appropriate way to do it. It's the appropriate way also to respect that dimension in which human beings somehow transcend themselves. Not everyone will do it. But, but, and those who do it, do it in very different ways. Human beings transcending themselves, it's still the human being that will be held legally accountable and the human being that has these legal entitlements. 
So the Human uh, Rights Council Resolution um, 1618, a turning point which also led to the Rabat Plan of Action. I'm a big fan of the Rabat Plan of Action, and I see a, a, cl a close connection also between 1618, the Rabat, and there were other issues around the Istanbul process, which, which will now enter in a, in a new phase uh, shortly, as we heard. Um, so uh, the Rabat Plan of Action is precise, as precise as a document of a few pages can be, when addressing the issue of limitations. And of course, freedom of expression has its limitations. Also, freedom of religion or belief has its limitations. But then the precision counts. And here, uh, the Rabat Plan of Action defines the threshold high and precisely. The threshold now more specifically concerning freedom of expression. High threshold and precisely defined, and it's spelled out in some details. And uh, I mean, even when it comes to hate it, okay, yeah, high threshold. Still a high threshold concerning restrictive measures, criminal law measures, and other measures which, I mean, par are part of the arsenal uh, that we employ to deal with complicated situations. But uh, like uh, Javier said, I would like to underline his modesty as a lawyer, don't expect too much from law. In particular, as he said, don't expect too much from criminal law. Criminal law has to play a role, but that will be a very limited role. And it should be a very limited role. It should be con confined to extreme cases and at the same time to very clear cases. Only when cases are clear and extreme, okay then, yeah. There will be cases. So if we don't expect, if we cannot expect much from criminal law, we have to do something else. And find other, maybe non-legal, non-restrictive measures to respond. To respond to provocation, to respond to hatred, to respond to disturbing ways in which people make use of their freedom of expression. And the best way to, to respond to disturbing ways in which way people may uh, use freedom of expression is, okay, say them, answer, respond, make use of freedom of expression in an alternative way. We do have good practice, practice examples in this. And let me quote my friend, Frank LaRue, until recently, Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression. We did a lot together, and we will actually continue the cooperation between the men that with his successor, David Kay. Uh, uh, Frank LaRue uh, listed good practices in this regard, and I will uh, now give you an example, a very strange example. You will surprise, you will be surprised. The very strange example which he gave was Geert Wilders, Fitna. The way the Dutch government handled this. The Dutch government said, for this or that reason, we cannot prohibit this from happening. By the way, trying to do so would even turn Gerd Wilders into a martyr of freedom of speech. He would love to see himself in that light. Yeah? Mm -hmm. No, we cannot, but we cannot for a number of reasons. But not prohibiting does not mean endorsing it. That's sometimes a misperception of those who think along a bipolary. So if not prohibiting that, it must be okay. No, far from it. It's not okay. This is stupid, it's offensive, it's tasteless, it's wrong, it's Islamophobic. Yeah. So it's not something we like. They said it very clearly, they said it very loudly. So the message, I think, came across and it helped to overcome misunderstanding. So it's very important. So this was a good example how the Dutch government handled that crisis situation. I, yeah, so, and uh, I think there are others. Uh, making use of freedom of expression means you cannot have it and, uh, and leave it at the same time. You cannot eat the cake and keep it at the same time. I mean, it means also you have to expect unpleasant ways. Uh, freedom of expression, yeah, you cannot expect too harmonious uses, but then, one has to expose the unpleasant ways and also say it, rather than giving the impression that uh, not prohibition means endorsement or trivialization. No, let's take it seriously. 
And uh, I mean, uh, we, de we do see examples. It's a bit strange that I, coming from Germany, now also in my very last minute, refer to a German example, the Pegida demonstrations, yeah? Islamophobic, stupid stuff. And um, uh, the good thing is that people expose their stupidity in the public sphere. I mean, these resentments are there anyway. They are a, a reality, but now it's exposed. And now people can respond. I mean, exposing it also means exposing this to counter demonstrations. And the counter demonstrations are much more impressive than these Islamic uh, demonstrations. And I mean, uh, the Pagidas, in the beginning, they don't do that any longer. They used the old slogan of the GDR revolution, Wir sind das Volk. We are the people. And it's so ridiculous. I mean, the, the ridiculousness of this is exposed. I mean, by seeing all these counter demonstrators uh, who uh, come up with different messages, messages of accommodation, of welcoming diversity. Uh, and they, use, they make use of freedom of expression in a different way, also reassuring, reassuring the minorities that they are welcome. And this is so much more impressive and so much more useful than any, positive, uh, any possible tribunal. Yeah? Uh, I think this is the way. It's the way to uh, appreciate freedom of expression. You cannot have it without living. Also, somehow, with unpleasant side effects. But Gerd Wilders is an unpleasant side effect. He's not the hero of speech. He's a free rider. OK, you have the free riders. But expose them. That is the way. So my first point is my last point. Yes, coexistence, freedom of religion and freedom of expression. They do coexist. They have to coexist. And as mutually reinforcing norms, this is not just an academic postulate. It's lived reality. I would like to see more realities. Thank you very much.